Yes, for almost 200,000 years, we humans have been living on this planet. And only up to, say, 150 years ago, we used to live a very different life. So, for example, our ancestors 150 years ago had a pretty good night's sleep because the night was actually dark and only in the evening there was very little light, maybe light coming from fire or candlelight. And during daytime, um, they were mostly outside, walking around, having a lot of physical activity. And food was also scarce, so maybe they're going in the morning hunting something or gathering something and uh, there are maximum two or three meals in a day. And then the last meal used to be in the evening because you could not store food overnight. But then industrial revolution happened 150 years ago. We got light, electrical lighting, and that also fueled food production and processing preservation. And then we got uh, infrastructure development. What is infrastructure? It's the method to move people, product, information, and waste from one place to another place with minimum human physical activity. So that means as infrastructure developed, our physical activity also reduced. So as a result, as our modern rhythms are very different. We spend almost 24 hours in indoor environment like this in dimly lit room. So for example, right now, if I take out my lux meter, then right here, I'm looking at maybe 200, 300 lux of light. If you're sitting there, then if you're lucky, then 40 to 50 lux of light. But if you just step outside, not even under the sun, that's 10,000 lux of light. So as a result, we have sleep deprivation and sleep disruption. And then, of course, we have less physical activity. And then we have been told again and again that our brain cannot work unless we eat in every two to three hours. So as a result, what has happened is, as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is open, so we keep eating throughout 24 hours. So as a result, you can see that um, our rhythms have changed over the last 150 years only. And this is really scary because we were not designed, our genome is not designed to adapt to these disruptive rhythms. So what happens when circadian rhythms are disrupted? So for example, if you just lose a couple of nights of sleep, or if you're jet lagged, it's not a disease or something serious because you'll lose, you'll have mood swings, maybe you're irritable, maybe you're not feeling really good, and that can happen to anyone from kids to older adults. But then if you continue that lifestyle, uh, what we call chronic jet lag or shift work, and you can relate very easily to firefighters, nurses who are card carrying shift workers, uh, who live in this life for many, many years, then that can increase the risk for many disease. And you might think that these are only, these apply only to nurses, firefighters, and pilots. But in reality, World Health Organization defines shift work as staying awake for two to three hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. for 50 days in a year. So that means almost every single new mom is a firefighter, if we look at the <laughs> sleep-wake cycle. And almost half, or maybe 80% of us here, are actually shift workers. In fact, there is a new paper that came out from Munich showing that 78% of people have the lifestyle of shift worker for at least five years in their life. And when these disease risks go up, there are also some serious ones. So the ones that are in red affect more than 10% of the population, adult population in the US. The yellow ones may affect five to 7%. So the field of circadian rhythm essentially deals with three different aspects. One at the bottom of the uh, graph, what I call training the circadian clock. So the simple things that we do, eating at the right, right time, sleeping, and light exposure, all that stuff, that's training the circadian clock. But at the same time, we can prevent, or maybe to some extent, manage disease, but we cannot actually treat disease, uh, severe disease. So that's why the second thing comes up, that's clocking the drugs. And why is that? Because we are learning that nearly 80% of FDA approved drug targets have circadian rhythm. And just imagine there are so many drugs that are in pipeline that have never been tested for circadian optimization. So that means just by changing the timing of drug delivery or changing the formulation, we may be able to add 10 to 15% efficacy to many of the drugs and also reduce adverse side effect. And then the third one on the top of the mountain is drugging the clock. 
we know that in many diseases, for example, in cancer, in tumors, uh, there is no functional circadian clock. So that's why there is no temporal discipline for these cells to divide only within a certain window. They can divide any time. And if we bring back that discipline by reactivating the clock, we can actually kill cancer. And in fact, last year we published a paper showing that one of the clock reactivating drug is much more efficient than the standard of care in treating glioblastoma in a, a PDX model, patient derived glioblastoma in mouse. So then the question is, what is circadian rhythm and how does it work? So mo most of us, as we relate to sleep-wake cycle, we know that there, there might be a clock in our brain that tells us when to sleep and when to wake up. And the fundamental aspect of that, uh, if we reduce it down to very simple wisdom, that means every organ that, that has a clock, just like brain, has a peak performance time, just like now is the best time to um, be alert and give a great talk, so that's why I picked this time. <laughs> um, at the same time, every organ also needs some downtime. So when we sleep, we repair, reset, and rejuvenate our brain. And just like our brain has a clock, in the last 20 years what we have learned is almost every single cell, every single organ has its own clock. In fact, last year we, uh, we did a very simple straightforward experiment. It was 10 years from inception to publication. That's to collect different cell types, different organs, and different brain regions from a non-human primate. We did that in baboon. And we found that nearly the entire genome is under circadian regulation in one organ or the other. So that means all these organs, they, or the clocks, they function as artists in an orchestra that produces daily rhythms in sleep, mood, metabolism, and even our microbiome also has clocks. And what we are also beginning to learn is this is not a one-way communication. The organs can also feed back to the brain. So by fixing the clock, maybe in peripheral organs, we may be able to re rewire the brain clock. And this whole thing is connected to the outside world through light perceived only through the retina. And almost 17 years ago, when I was a grad student, sorry, postdoc, that's the time when we discovered this blue light sensing protein called melanopsin. That's present in only 5,000 neurons in human retina. That senses blue light, and, it, and these are hardware to 17 different brain regions. And these cells are less sensitive to orange light or firelight. As a result, when our ancestors had this uh, firelight or candlelight in the evening, uh, the brain was actually thinking that it's dark, so the sleep hormone melatonin began to rise and they had better night's sleep. In daytime, these cells actually need a huge amount of light, almost 1,000 lux of light just to, for, to wake them up. As a result, when they stepped outside, the bright light activated melanopsin, and then the clock was resynchronized that raised alertness, reduced depression. And in fact, I would say that the best antidepressant is to actually walk outside and expose yourself to half an hour or one hour of bright light. It's plentiful and it's free. You just have to walk outside. But our new um, anthropogenic world is very different. We stay indoor for 24-7. And in fact, uh, the cell phone companies know that we spend 87% of our time indoor. And that's throughout 24 hours. So as a result, the bright screen and bright light at night can activate melanopsin at the wrong time. We have sleep disturbances. And during daytime, we are sitting in an environment like this. And there are a lot of people, including myself. I actually have a light meter here. And I monitored myself. I realized that even when I was working at SOG, the only time I was getting exposure to outside light when I was driving from home to work and work to home. And if I was wearing sunglasses, then I was not getting even that light. So I stopped wearing sunglasses a few years ago. And so what happens is, with this kind of lighting, uh, that can promote, say, insomnia or foggy brain during daytime. And if it continues for months or years, then it, they can raise uh, risk for some of these diseases. So as a result, the idea is, can we manage lighting to improve health? And as you heard, it's gratifying to see that 3 billion devices in this world are now adopting what we discovered almost 17 years ago, uh, but it's not actually going to help you that much. What is going to help you is to being aware about lighting. And in fact, what we believe is in the future, in the next seven to eight years, this $150 billion LED industry will incorporate circadian lighting and hopefully we'll have circadian lighting in hospitals, in old age homes, or even in uh, ch children's schools and daycare. And that will be the beginning of a really 
impactful circadian lighting uh, on brain. And few years ago, almost seven years ago, we made another discovery that is when food is presented at the wrong time, then light is not the measure and trainer of the clock. Food, big food overrides the effect of light. So, how does it really uh, work? So, I will kind of simplify everything into this small uh, simple graph. That is, when we eat during daytime, as soon as we have our first calorie, first bite, our body begins to burn some carbohydrate and store some carb as fat. And as we continue throughout the day, it continues like that. And then after our last calorie, a burning sugar and a storing fat kind of slows down and our body kind of begins to tap on to burning fat after six to seven hours after the last meal. And this is when one phase of the clock is kind of going away and then the repair, rejuvenation and burning, all this stuff is uh, coming in. But just within 15 minutes of having that next breakfast, we switch that clock again. So, as a result, what happens is if we take the same calories and then distribute it over a long period of time, 15 to 16 hours, then that dampens our circadian rhythm almost in every organ. And we do not have that downtime for many of the organs to repair, reset and rejuvenate. So, as a result, we thought that how can we, so the importance of this rhythm. So, we took mice and we put them on 10 hour eating or 8 hour eating and then 15 or ad lib eating and then what we found is without changing calorie, without changing the type of food, we can make a mouse healthy or sick just by feeding it within 10 to 12 hours or letting it to eat 15 hours or longer. So, what is it taking us now? So, this concept of entraining circadian clock by what we call time restricted eating and in popular media now it is called intermittent fasting. Um, can prevent or reduce the risk of many of these diseases that are listed here. And what was surprising was um, in our mice, in our fruit flies, we saw that fruit flies and mice, they actually started to sleep better. And the reason for sleeping better was their arousal threshold went up. So, they could get into deeper sleep. And based on that idea, now in last three to four years, we are seeing in mouse models at least, this time restricted eating can also reduce the severity of say Alzheimer's disease and, and Huntington disease. So, beginning to understand how peripheral metabolism in our gut, in our liver is affecting the brain and hopefully this will lead to uh, much better clinical trials and, uh, and combining drugs with circadian rhythm optimization to address some of the health. So, the way I look at the whole thing is we are kind of in the lead and asbestos moment in human history when it comes to circadian rhythm, because we created this anthropogenic world with shift work, with no clear attention to lighting and sleep. And now we know that this erratic lifestyle that we, that we built is not health promoting, it is disease promoting. And the good news is if we can switch that back by simple circadian lifestyle or timing the drugs or drugging the clock, those approaches can be multi-solving. And why those multi-solving approaches are more important is, if you look at most of the patients, they do not have, they do not suffer from one disease. They mostly suffer from syndrome. And that means, we can, we have to bring one solution for multiple disease approach. And we strongly believe that at least circadian rhythm, this field is going to contribute in a big way in those multi-solving approaches. Thank you.